Good morning, and thank you, John, for that uh, kind introduction. Um, we're fortunate to have uh, this distinguished panel of experts um, for today's session on how gene and cell therapies lead to disruptions in medical and surgical care, which can be transformative, as we saw in the video. So as a cardiothoracic surgeon and transplant specialist, I've been fortunate to uh, treat thousands of patients um, with ischemic heart disease, valve disease, and even end-stage organ failure using conventional therapies such as coronary artery bypass, valve replacement, transplantation even, and mechanical circuitry support using gross tools like sutures and scalpels. Cell and gene therapies have changed our approach and offer such promise for the future. We hope to explore how they are being implemented and perfected, as we saw in the video, to change lives. Things like hematology, diabetes, neuropsychiatric disorders, tumors, all can be treated and even cured in common applications of this technology. So we want to ask our panelists how these disruptive technologies and interventions are making a difference. And quite frankly, thinking about the implementation of this science, we want to understand what are the obstacles and challenges. So we'll ask each of our panelists to introduce themselves and speak briefly about the technologies that they are exploring and how they are applying them and what are the obstacles in terms of where we go as we uh, discover new ways to treat disease. So I'll turn to Irina and ask her to introduce herself and we'll, uh, we'll start the discussion. Irina. Thank you very much. Um, good morning, everyone. Uh, my name is Irina Antonievich. I'm the Chief Medical Officer and Head of R&D at Triplet Therapeutics. Triplet Therapeutics is a company in Cambridge, Massachusetts. We are developing novel therapeutics. We are focusing on nucleic acid therapeutics. Our lead candidate is an antisense oligonucleotide. And we are targeting an underlying common genetic mechanism that is responsible not only for one, but for multiple diseases. We call these diseases repeat expansion disorders. One of the most prominent uh, disorders among this sort of group is Huntington's disease. But there are other um, indications such as spinocerebellar ataxias and also myotonic dystrophy type 1. All of those disorders affect the brain to some extent, many exclusively, such as Huntington's disease, or predominantly, such as in Huntington's disease. So our goal was to administer an antisense oligonucleotide to those brain regions where this underlying common uh, genetic mechanism occurs. And we are not targeting the disease gene itself, but a mechanism upstream of the individual disease gene. Therefore, we can affect with the same molecule multiple repeat expansion disorders. So our first challenge was how do we make sure that our drug reaches the brain areas where it needs to exert its mechanism? So the general wisdom over the last few years has been that an antisense oligonucleotide for a brain disorder can be injected intrathecally. We have done our own research with an intrathecal injection and we have found that actually such an administration does not lead to brain-wide delivery, in particular not to delivery to the deep brain areas. Uh, we have since then seen multiple uh, treatment failures with an intrathecally delivered ASO. We have switched, therefore, about two years ago to an ICV intracerebroventricular route of administration. Our current preclinical data show very clearly that this makes a fundamental difference. So an ASO is really readily taken up by brain cells, in particular by neurons, and once the ASO is delivered into the cerebroventricular space, it is taken up by those neurons in the deep brain areas. And in animals, we have clearly shown in non-human primates uh, that we can deliver to those key brain areas and we can engage our target in a way that we think it's meaningful as we think of our clinical trial that we have planned to start um, this year. Great, thank you. Uh, Rachel? 
Yeah, good morning, everybody. My name is Rachel McMahon. I'm, I'm founder and CEO of Neurogene. Uh, I founded the company about four years ago uh, with the vision to treat devastating neurological diseases and was really uh, truly inspired by the Zolgensma paper um, that I'm sure many of you have read. And, and if you haven't seen the videos of these amazing children with spinal mus muscular atrophy who you know, have a normal lifespan of two years, um, and with this one genetic treatment are, you know, running around, hanging from monkey bars. It was just this kind of crystallizing moment for me in my career, uh, in my personal life, wanting to do something for uh, just these horrible, complex neurological diseases that really have had no treatments for decades. Uh, my brother is, is personally affected by debilitating rare neurological diseases, and that, that was really this, this moment for me to say, okay, I'm, I'm going to be part of this genetic medicine revolution. Uh, so we uh, started using AAV and, and developing lots of preclinical data, but it's interesting, you know, just piggybacking off of Irina, I think, you know, there's two really, really critical challenges in implementing going from this amazing, you know, almost case study with Zolgensma of just inspiring data uh, that was, you know, really just opened up the field like never before in terms of capital investment and lots of companies sort of following in footstep. I think a lot of, a lot of people just sort of naively rushed in and said, okay, let's just copy and paste everything that was done with Zolgensma, no matter what the disease pathobiology. And as a result of that, I think you've seen the implementation has actually been much, much harder. Uh, so we did something very similar where we ran a non-human primate study and compared uh, IV administration, intrathecal lumbar, intraventricular administration, and even a cisterna magna administration to just with the same product, with the same dose, to really try to understand scientifically what kind of delivery really maximizes viral distribution to the brain. Because at the end of the day, if you're treating a CNS disorder, you know, IV is nice, but it's a one-time treatment. So, you know, uh, patients hopefully would understand and caregivers would understand if it was a more invasive <coughs> treatment. And we also settled in on uh, interventricular administration, as it turns out, because that, uh, you know, really had the best, not just best biodistribution, but it's also the most commonly used procedure relative to cisterna magna, which has its own history uh, and, uh, you know, safety concerns associated with it. So delivery has been a huge focus for us as a company, uh, and we are going to be dosing our first patient hopefully soon. The second thing I would say is not just getting to the target tissues that you care about within the brain, uh, in our case, but also making sure that the transgene, so just, you know, dumping a bunch of AAV into the brain, doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be safe and efficacious. So some of the diseases that we're interested in treating, so for example, Rett syndrome is, is a highly dosage sensitive disorder. So if you get too much, it's very toxic. If you have too little, you have the disease of Rett syndrome. So we've developed a self-regulating gene therapy technology that really blunts the overexpression related toxicity. And I think you know, hopefully the field will be continuing to employ these types of methods as well as others to really deliver consistent levels of transgene. So it's getting to the right tissue types, but then also getting the right set points so that you're in a therapeutic range that is not toxic. Um, so happy to talk about that further, but, you know, we'll turn it over to Harif for, for his own challenges and other areas. Great. Thank you. You're, you're really starting to examine the challenges of implementing great science. So, Harith. Uh, thanks for allowing me to be here. It's a real pleasure. I'm a Brigham-trained cardiology fellow who became really passionate about the problem of type 2 diabetes because of the coexistence of type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, because of the prevalence of type 2 diabetes in my family and in my patients. And one of the things that really began to bother me about 10 years ago is that everything that we're doing in type 2 diabetes is symptomatically treating the blood sugar condition, but is not really thinking hard enough about the root cause mechanisms that lead to type 2 diabetes in the body, which leads us to apply pharmacological solutions systemically. Now there are 60 approved drugs for type 2 diabetes, but the number of people who are inadequately controlled has never been larger. 
So the idea 10 years ago when we started Fractal is, is there a way to target root cause mechanisms in a way that may be broadly accessible for the masses of people who are not able to get their disease under control with pharmacology because the underlying disease is progressive despite the medicines that we take. Bariatric surgery was the inspiration for us because bariatric surgery can clearly be a single point in time intervention that can reverse type 2 diabetes and all of its related metabolic consequences virtually instantaneously. But amazingly, it's an intervention on the gut rather than on the pancreas or the other organs that we might otherwise have thought about. So that was the founding inspiration. We became um, sort of scientifically focused on understanding the mechanisms of the surgery and uncovered that there's a focal pathology in a region of the intestine bypassed by some of these surgeries that is a primary root cause driver of insulin resistance. And so then we became obsessed with how do we precisely target this focal pathology. And our first product is a device that ablates the mucosa of the duodenum in order to reverse insulin resistance and is in now two pivotal studies in the United States after 10 years of development, 500 patient years of exposure and pilot studies, aiming to try to reduce disease burden in type 2 diabetes, starting with late stage insulin treated patients and then moving earlier. What that first device, which is called Revita, does not do is correct pancreatic failure at the end stage of type 2 diabetes. So the next question became, how might we reverse islet dysfunction and pancreatic dysfunction in type 2 diabetes? And as and we too were inspired by some of the progress being made in gene therapy, and we became convinced that gene therapy for islet dysfunction is feasible, but it's principally a risk-benefit calculus. And a lot of the risk in gene therapy ties to the biodistribution of the gene vector and product um, where you don't necessarily want it to go. We happen to be really good at the precise delivery of therapies to the gut, and so we developed a device to precisely deliver adeno-associated virus directly to the pancreas after exploring many routes of administration and have preclinical proof of concept in a pancreatic delivered AAV gene therapy delivering metabolic hormones like GLP-1 to be produced locally within the pancreas. And our preclinical studies thus far suggest that long-term remission from type 2 diabetes is achievable. And the core question is how do you develop a durable remission for a million people a year if you want to keep up with the incidence of type 2 diabetes in the population. And so we are really, really focused on over the next couple of decades, how are we going to get ourselves to a place where we can develop gene therapy to a place where it is safe and broadly accessible enough that it can be a solution to a major public health emergency of very large magnitude. Great. Really exciting work and progress in terms of innovation uh, in that concept. Um, we also have joining us virtually uh, Bastiano Sana, who has been working uh, in this space of cell and gene therapies for hemoglobinopathies, but also type 1 and type 2 diabetes. So, uh, Bastiano. Thanks for the, for the intro. I'm sorry I had to be here virtually, something that um, I, I had hoped was not, uh, was not the case, but um, we live in these times. And um, so, first of all, uh, I am uh, um, the chief of seven gene therapies at uh, Vertex. Um, we have a large uh, program in seven gene uh, from, uh, uh, like you said, hemoglobinopathies, where we use uh, gene editing to precisely lead and um, fix some of the issues with, uh, with, um, with sickle cell and beta tau. Uh, we have uh, a stem cell program for type 1 diabetes. So it's not type 2. You know, uh, we, we'll, uh, we'll, uh, we'll, we focus on type 1. And then we have uh, a gene therapy for um, Duchenne dystrophy and um, DM1. Uh, so we have a range of programs uh, when it comes to cell and gene. We have uh, autologous uh, cell therapy, like for... Uh, 
um, for immunoglobinopathies, we have uh, allogeneic off-the-shelf stem cell drive um, therapies for type 1 diabetes. We have uh, AV9 mediated uh, editing for um, for Duchenne. Uh, for diabetes, we actually have uh, a very innovative approach uh, with uh, with a device. So we have the the, the full uh, the full range. I would say that there's, there's, there's nothing that is. Uh, not of interest of us because we really focus on the disease, less on the technology. That has always been our strategy, uh, focusing on the disease, and we use whatever tools are the most amenable and conducive to really uh, have breakthroughs, as opposed to technologies or uh, disease areas. So that's kind of like a, our our approach. Um, there is so there is there is quite of a range of things we do, but I think the the challenge that I maybe like to discuss today uh, is common to all of these uh, areas, which is the manufacturing of these products. Um, as opposed to um, other approaches, for example, uh, some of the uh, diseases we're trying to tackle are very large in, in their numbers, very prevalent. Let's, let's take type 1 diabetes. There's like 2.5 uh, million patients in the world with type 1 diabetes. Each one of them uh, as the unique and sole cause of the disease uh, coming from the destruction of the beta cells from the immune system. So each one of those patients, regardless of where they are controlled or not, the cause of the disease is the beta cells. So we found a way, you know, uh, starting many years ago uh, with the studies that uh, uh, Doug Melton started at, uh, at um, at Harvard, and then they were perfected at a, a company called Sema Therapeutics, of which I was the CEO. And now at the Vertex, we found a way of making those cells, the beta cells in the lab in industrial quantities. It's uh, not an easy challenge to think about making those cells in those quantities. So as opposed to other approaches that mm -hmm. tackle rare or ultra rare diseases, we have a very prevalent, very prevalent chronic disease. So the challenge is to how you find a way of making enough of the product, of the right quality, of course, so that you can treat all of these patients. And uh, that is a challenge that uh, is, uh, for type 1 diabetes, is a challenge we have for uh, uh, the hemoglobinopathies, of which, again, there are several, several thousand people that uh, are affected by these diseases. And to some extent, uh, is uh, the same for AAV9, where the disease might be not prevalent, actually it is rare or very rare, but uh, being a systemic uh, type of therapy, the for muscles, which is the largest organ in the, in the human body, the quantity is really, you know, is very large. Quant the, the title of the virus you need to add. So our challenge, then, or major challenge, the things that kind of keeps me awake <laughs> the most is how do we scale up? How do we have a technology that is robust enough to make really large amounts of these products, because definitely we want to address each one of the, the needs of those of those patients. Great, thank you, Bastiani. You've certainly framed the, the challenge in terms of the scope and the uh, broad nature of this uh, challenge. Uh, Jeff, uh, certainly last but not least, in terms of our uh, discussion, maybe you can uh, describe how you are applying um, your work uh, from a neurosurgical standpoint. I'm Jeff Schweitzer. I'm a neurosurgeon at Massachusetts General Hospital with a particular interest in neurosurgery for functional disorders, including Parkinson's disease. Many of you may know that Parkinson's is the second most common degenerative disease of the nervous system after Alzheimer's. It affects something like 1.5 million people in this country. So some common themes that you're hearing here with uh, diseases that are widespread that need solutions. The concept of cell therapy for Parkinson's goes back over 40 years. The major motor symptoms of this disease are related to loss of a very specific population of neurons from a very specific place in the brain. And the hope has been that by replacing those cells, the function could be restored. Uh, many sources of cells were tried between 1980 and 2000. The one that was the most successful was human fetal midbrain. Uh, this required harvesting of aborted human fetuses. 
Uh, and although the open label trials were encouraging, there were issues with the uh, blinded studies related to logistics, technique, and other things. But it was very clear that a therapy that depended on aborted human fetuses was going to run into problems, not just medical, but also logistic and ethical, and was never going to be a good solution for those 1.5 million people. The advent of stem cell technologies uh, opened a new era for this, and there are two major branches of cell therapy techniques that can be applied to Parkinson's disease. One using embryonic stem cells, which is still foreign tissue and still ultimately derived from human embryos, and one using induced pluripotent stem cells, which can be made from the patient themselves. We chose that latter approach. We think there are advantages to not needing to use immunosuppression, uh, as you do for some unknown period of time with the embryonic stem cell approach. We also think that it is more appealing and likely to get better patient acceptance knowing where the cells came from and that it was their own body. So we have developed in a laboratory as a um, group working in the Harvard Medical School ecosystem, the technology to make autologous cells from a patient's skin fibroblast, uh, d d differentiate them into autologous stem cells and then redifferentiate them into dopaminergic neurons to be placed back into specific locations in the brain. We then have the challenges twofold. How do you get these cells to survive when they're put into the place you want them to go, to survive and form the correct connections? And then ultimately, if you're successful, how do you make a personalized technology like this available to those 1.5 million people? To overcome that first set of challenges, we developed new technology for injection and implantation of these cells. Traditionally, whether it was fetal tissue or stem cells, about 90 plus percent of the cells you wanted to survive would not make it through this implantation process or would die inside the brain. So by using autologous cells, we overcome rejection, but we still have inflammation. We have lack of an immediate supply of oxygen and glucose to these cells when they're placed into the brain. These are all active areas that we are working on because we feel that the solution to this problem is not to put in 10 times the number of cells that you need. But we're making good headway with this. The next um, challenge we're gonna face is making this widely available. We did our pilot study in a single patient a few years ago. This was published in the New England Journal in 2020. Our uh, IND application for our clinical trial is sitting in front of the FDA right now. But ultimately, where we're headed with this is to try to standardize the process, the workflow, to make it possible for individual patients to have their own cells made, but to have the process be so reproducible that it can be mass produced and made widely available the way perhaps LASIK is these days. That's the dream to make this available to the 1.5 million people who would benefit from it. Well, great. So uh, I think our panelists have really framed the question very effectively for us as these disruptive technologies are applied to clinical medicine. It really is the implementation science that we uh, hope to explore. And we have a, a question from the audience to Irina and to uh, Rachel. As uh, ICV delivery is invasive for patients requiring a burr hole, uh, Jeff, this is uh, also inclusive of your specialty, what problems do you encounter with intrathecal lumbar and cisterna magna delivery? that pointed you to uh, ICV therapies? And how is ICV tolerated by patients as an alternative to a very invasive approach? Should I start? Sure. So, great question. Um, and of course, a question that we asked ourselves um, at the beginning. The decision to go uh, with the ICV route was really driven by data. We have done our studies in non-human primates, and we have seen the significant, therapeutically very, very relevant difference between injecting something IT and injecting an ASO, an antisense oligonucleotide ICV. So the data clearly pointed us to this route of administration, and we have also done cisterna magna administrations that were in between IT and ICV, but I think also, as, as Rachel pointed out, uh, we have to do repeat administration, so an ICM administration is, 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 is kind of like safety-wise, uh, difficult for, for repeat administration. Now, 
We then started to look into um, the history of ICV, and ICV has been really used for more than 60 years. It is actually a very well-established route of administration. Uh, we have wonderful neurosurgeon consultants, uh, and <laughs> the beauty with working with neurosurgeons is that when you approach them about ICV, they see, say, that's a piece of cake. I hope <laughs> Jeffrey agrees with that. For them, this is such a routine, a minimally invasive procedure. It is done very quickly, doesn't require general anesthesia. We have had uh, patient panels, we invited patients that reflect sort of our very early stage disease group of, of, of people with HD in particular, and we had the neurosurgeon uh, there explaining the procedure. At the end of the panels, we asked the participants, would you consider a trial? Would you consider therapy? And unanimously, the participants responded, yes, they have a terrible disease, a fatal disease. They know that there is no escape. These are all genetic diseases for which there is no, not even a proper therapy. These participants want something that stops the disease early in the course. Um, and there has just been a recent paper, and I'm sorry I blanked the journal, but this just reinforces that patients that have a terrible fatal disease, they have seen their parents, it's an autosomal dominant disease, suffer terribly, they want something and they don't really care much about the route of administration as long as it is effective. And since then I do want to stress that we have learned that repeat intrathecal administration, not only do we believe based on our data and published data doesn't get to the deep brain, it is not convenient for patients either. We have seen that there is an inflammatory signal in the CSF. The patients that we have had dialogues with, they clearly say they cannot imagine decades-long treatment with repeat intrathecal. So putting all of the information together, we think that intracerebroventricular is not only feasible, it is actually better. And ultimately for the participants, the patients more convenient, and there is a possibility once the device is implanted for an at-home delivery, which means for patients, again, that there is a minimal time out of their busy life, they can actually uh, get the, the treatment administered at home. Well, that's so, promising. Rachel? <laughs> Yeah, so, so there's some similarities and differences. With gene therapy, you're talking about a single one-time administration. So I think we just need to level set. Um, but, but most importantly, just like Irina, I mean, this was a data-driven decision. To give you a sense, it, for key brain regions, um, IT lumbar was delivering 10 to 100-fold lower biodistribution in key regions of the brain, 10 to 100-fold. And again, you're weighing de certain death or you know, certain disability, you know, dramatic disability, depending on the disease that we're talking about, but with our lead indication, certain death. We've studied this um, for our lead indication in sheep, and you know, it was very well tolerated, believe it or not. There are Batten disease sheep you know, walking around New Zealand, and you can study them. Uh, but they tolerated it very, very well, and you know, efficacy really trumps it. And I, the thing I would say about gene therapy, even though there are com many companies working on it, right now, sitting here today, there is no redosing paradigm. So if you're going to dose a patient with something that you know is giving, you know, substantially lower biodistribution to the brain, you know, why would you do that? So I, I think the, you know, the benefits far outweigh the risks. It's obviously some invasiveness. I, I don't know if I would use the word minimal because I'm not a neurosurgeon. <laughs> it is very well practiced and we did do a lot of surveys. And just the last comment relative to ICM, you know, that is a procedure that many gene therapy companies are uh, employing. But when we pulled neurosurgeon after neurosurgeon, you know, the, the feedback was like, yikes, um, I'm not ready for that. And, and ICV is just much more standard of care especially as we think about globalizing this. So we're, as a company, we'll monitor, and if ICM becomes more of a standard of care, the biodistribution is actually uh, pretty much equivalent between ICV and ICM. So that was really more of a, a decision based on just the comfort and, and practice of neurosurgeons today. Great, thank you very much. So I think we could spend uh, any number of hours discussing the trials and tribulations of uh, applying uh, these uh, innovative therapies in the clinical setting. But I think a, an important question that comes from the audience is, 
to choose for our panelists one major setback that you've had either in the cell or gene therapy application and what do you see uh, you learn from that experience? So maybe we'll start with uh, Bastiano in terms of uh, made one major setback and uh, what have you learned and how has it changed your practice going forward? So one of the things that uh, I started doing cell therapy long, a, a, a while ago and um, one of the things that uh, uh, was uh, I would say not very popular, but was the, the, the most common reasoning was that uh, there was a, no need for, um, in, for a vertical integration of the, of, the, of the programs, meaning that you could outsource a lot of it. You, know, they were, you, could, uh, you could do everything with um, external manufacturing, you could do cross development uh, with consultants, uh, and um, this new era of this new medicine, cell engine, would be agile, would be nimble. And uh, in my experience, that really did not work. Um, there are severe, uh, severe challenges in doing things in that way. And I think it speaks to how, how fast, I think it was something that was said at the beginning, how fast the uh, area this morning, uh, how fast the life cycle you know, of, uh, of, this pro of our products uh, is. Meaning that um, uh, sometimes the time between research, plus development, manufacturing, clinical, and then commercial is so compressed that um, there is a need for such a close integration of, uh, of um, everything under the same kind of, under the same umbrella. So that was an hard lesson that I learned early. And um, that's why we are doing things a bit different now in terms of integrating really everything under one umbrella, including owning our own, at least uh, uh, for our clinical, our own manufacturing and our own uh, process development and, and, and research. That's, that was something that um, uh, I had to learn the hard way. Uh, I, think, uh, I think most of us that do cell engine have been uh, in the situation of uh, technology transfer gone awfully wrong. And uh, once you do a couple of those, definitely you don't want to do more. Great, thank you. Jeff? Well, one of the principles of surgery is that you always have to have a plan B, and you always have to be thinking about how you're going to get yourself out of trouble if you get into it. The major problem that we have is that these cells are going to be permanently implanted into patients. You can't turn them off or take them out again, and so uh, making certain that they are clinical grade and safe is of the utmost importance, and that includes with stem cell technology being absolutely certain that they cannot develop into teratomas or other tumors. What we found with our autologous approach is that there are likely patients who are simply not candidates for this. Uh, we did a study looking at the ability of fibroblasts from different patients to undergo this process and found that there were some people who have developed so many somatic mutations in their cells that we simply could not generate safe lines from them. Uh, so it becomes clear that between the reprogramming, the passaging, and the processing, there are going to be some patients who need things like embryonic stem cells that are a single standardized product. This was something of a surprise. We are aware that a Japanese group uh, led by Takahashi, who had also planned to do autologous therapy, gave up on the approach because of this problem and ended up going with a bank of HLA match cells instead. So the principle of autologous matching uh, doesn't always work out, and there will always need to be alternatives. Great, thanks. Howard? Yeah, I'll choose two that I think are particularly pressing right now and go through them quickly. One of them is, how much better does a custom AAV serotype need to be in its efficacy to be willing to expose yourself to the unknown risk of the safety profile relative to a known AAV that has a human database of safety experience thus far? You know, I think that that's a, that's a fundamental question that for which there is no good answer because you're taking um, something that is known that is 
for which there's a lot of experience and regulatory comfort versus something that is unknown may be better, and how much better does it need to be? Um, that's, that's a question that we're tackling right now. A second question is really um, more of sort of like a financing strategy and strategic question. Yesterday there was a panel about um, capital formation around gene therapy. And we have a pipeline product in gene therapy. It's not our first product. It's, it's something that's sitting behind it. It's not going to get as much capital as the first one. And do you spin it out and then make sure that it has the capital that it needs? And one of the reasons why we have not done that yet is because it's almost inevitable that in the development of these things, you're going to encounter challenge after challenge after challenge. And you can't tackle all of these challenges at the same time. Some of them are sequential learning events that need to be de-risked systematically. So one of the actually weird benefits of having this be a pipeline product for us is that we just know there's going to be six or seven challenges before we get into the clinic. And because it's not something that the market is expecting us to deliver on by a certain date, that we feel like we have the benefit of taking the time to get it right. And the fact that it's not our lead program and is not valued in a way that people are expecting to see X by Y date actually ends up being an advantage for us because it allows us to be methodical. Whereas if it were what, the one thing that we had, we would be forced to cut corners in the rush to achieve with the capital that's been allocated to us. Great. Yeah, I would say in terms of you know ma major setback, uh, they are common, <laughs> common in the industry, and and I think that the company that you know how you face those those challenges really determines who you who you are as a company. Uh, very early on, uh, as we were progressing towards what we thought was an I and D, uh, we discovered that uh, one of our plasmids was riddled. Uh, with deletions uh, in, in a key area. And you know, this was just scientific evidence and we had a whole debate of what do we do, do we move forward? And, and we found the answer was, you know, we're not helping anybody by introducing an unstable plasmid that could end up with like much longer term consequences. So it was very painful, um, but it was an important uh, learning for us that we needed to do a lot more quality control Earlier on, we had licensed a lot of you know, programs initially from, from academic institutions. We've since transitioned to have our own design and analytical capabilities internally. So it's made us stronger as a company, but we did have to go back to our board and our investors and delay you know, capital coming into the company as a result of making this important, uh, what we thought was like the right decision for the longer term. But, you know, those are the types of, of challenges that I think, you know, everybody faces something along those lines. And, and that was, you know, manufacturing is just still in its infancy and really bringing in analytics much earlier into the process, as you heard from Dr. Marks uh, from the FDA yesterday, uh, is, is critical if you're in the gene uh, and I'm sure cell therapy space as well. Thank you. Yeah, I'll be brief. Uh, what we have come to appreciate is when you administer ASOs, that there is something that is related to the total amount of ASO you do administer, and this um, impacts both the amount you administer in one dose, but also the so-called loading dose paradigm. So together with our own data, but also other data, unfortunately also clinical data, I think we have come to appreciate that we um, have to be careful how we administer these ASOs, that they are not innocuous, but they can be a, a good therapy if we have potent ASOs that do not require loading dose paradigm. So we administer lower doses and with uh, greater intervals between the doses so that we don't overload the, I just say the brain is a, a very sensitive organ. Um, and so this is uh, where we can find the right dose range. Um, and so we have come to appreciate this as we have done our preclinical studies. Great. Well, we really have uh, learned uh, many great lessons from our panelists. Um, probably um, those of you in the audience could probably uh, repeat some of them um, for us. I think we, uh, there's extraordinary excitement about cell and gene therapy, uh, real kinetic energy, um, but what we're hopeful is we can turn that into uh, true electricity to help improve patients' uh, lives. Uh, what we learned is that the transparency um, for the fall, the failures, is as important as the success. 
and uh, sharing them widely and acknowledging them is really important. So uh, on behalf of uh, um, Mass General Brigham and um, all of you who have participated, I want to say congratulations to the organizers and thank you for the opportunity to share uh, some reflections uh, about the uh, really extraordinary potential of cell and gene therapy. And thank you so much. Thank you to our panelists.